Welcome to lecture 9 of ECE 4305, Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will continue our study of modulation schemes and look at several more advanced modulation schemes, um, including uh, quadrature phase shift skiing, um, um, MRE uh, phase shift skiing, MRE pulse amplitude modulation, and a new one, MRE quadrature amplitude modulation. So let's start off with um, our study of quadrature phase shift keying. So quadrature phase shift keying is slightly different than binary phase shift keying. In the sense that in binary phase shift keying, or BPSK, we only had two waveforms to play with in order to determine what binary sequence was transmitted. Um, of course, um, being a binary modulation scheme, uh, those two waveforms either represented over one or a zero. Now, quadrature phase shift keying is a little bit more interesting because quadrature phase shift keying um, actually now takes a pair of binary digits or bits um, and encodes it into one of four possible unique waveforms. So equation one uh, describes the mathematical description of the signaling waveforms used in QPSK, where it's actually a combination of cosine and sine wave functions um, with phases, but notice how the amplitude values um, can either be a plus or a negative um, value of a constant amplitude A. So let's look at this graphically for a minute. So how does the QPSK waveform look like? So as, as indicated before, each signal constellation point can be represented by plus or minus a cosine omega ct plus theta plus or minus a sine omega ct plus theta. So the first thing to notice is that we use um, a, a, a sine and a cosine here in order to um, uh, modulate our, our um, binary information into a symbol um, that consists of um, essentially two waveforms that are 90 degrees or orthogonal to each other in, um, in phase, right? Um, they have the same phase and now they have different amplitudes and we saw this before uh, with BPSK where if we have a negative amplitude of a cosine it's actually 180 degrees out of phase with the positive value of that cosine representation. So let's draw this. So we have our signal constellation uh, uh, plane. So we have the in phase and a quadrature, the real and imaginary axes, if you will. And so let's say if we wanted to do um, um, S1 of t, and it's represented by a cosine and a sine, it would look like the following. It would essentially look like this guy here. So let's say that's S1 of t, the representation from the origin. And the way I chose that is, first of all, um, we're assuming a theta offset, right? And so we're representing this guy in terms of, um, yeah, uh, in, in, the, in the positive domain, um, the, the, the a cosine and a sine. And now what happens is if we start populating the rest of this signal constellation waveform, uh, representation, so we, let's say that's our S2, S3, and S4 of T. What we've got here now is our signal constellation diagram for QPSK, and what you notice is that all the signal constellation points are sort of at these four corners, if you will, um, of, of, of the um, IQ plane, and um, they're all 90 degrees separated Right? And that's because of how uh, we've chosen a, uh, the, the a values and the minus and plus. Uh, because what happens is, remember, like a cosine, we might be 180 uh, degrees out of phase. And, and so we, let's say this guy here, the sine is kept the same, but the cosine is uh, essentially 180 degrees apart. And this is when we have the sine that's 180 degrees apart, but the cosine is kept the same. So we basically quarter our uh, IQ plane into these four quadrants and these four different signal constellation points.
So now that we know how QPSK looks like in terms of its signal diagram um, or signal constellation formation, let's proceed just like before to calculate the power efficiency of QPSK. So from last class we saw there were several steps involved in order to calculate the power efficiency or epsilon p of a modulation scheme. We have to compute the minimum Euclidean distance and we have to compute the average bit energy expended. So in this example, we will um, explore how we derive these two parameters in order to provide us with the power efficiency. Now, there will be several very interesting things. Um, first of all, we will truly understand um, the concept of minimum Euclidean distance because um, as opposed to last class where we saw only binary modulation schemes, in this class, um, the, the idea behind the minimum Euclidean distance, not just the Euclidean distance, the minimum Euclidean distance will become apparently, much more apparent. Um, secondly, uh, since we're dealing now with more than one bit representing each sig uh, unique signal waveform, we now have a pair of bits. So we're going to look at how we get average bit energy from average, average symbol energy, because before it was a one-to-one -one mapping, but not, not in this case. So first, let's compute the minimum Euclidean distance. And the minimum Euclidean distance is the difference between two signaling waveforms for QPSK. Take their difference, square it, and then integrate over the um, time period for that, for that waveform. Um, so what happens is, if we did that, first of all, we need to find the signal constellation, uh, signal constellation points that provide us with the smallest possible uh, a distance or Euclidean distance and that's actually why uh, signal constellation diagrams are so neat because we can actually look at it and say which two symbols are physically the closest in the IQ plane. So if we choose any two wave, uh, uh, unique waveforms in the signal constellation that are closest and usually they're the adjacent ones in the QPSK modulation what we end up getting, and you should try this out at home, um, is that the minimum Euclidean distance is equal to 2a squared t. Now, for finding the average bit energy, the first thing you need to do is find the average, uh, the average symbol energy. So that turns out to be um, related to how far each signal constellation point is from the origin. And, and that, that is so, so what we need to do is essentially um, integrate uh, from 0 to t um, the square of each signaling waveform, which in other words, it's almost like calculating the Euclidean distance from the origin to the signal constellation point for all the signal constellation points. So since we have four of them, we have to compute ES1, ES2, ES3, ES4. Because QPSK is a phase modulation, which means that the amplitude motion, uh, 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 the amplitude of uh, uh, information is not is not modulated uh, with any sort of information. It doesn't fluctuate or anything. All signal constellation points theoretically should be the same distance away from the origin. Therefore, they should all have the same power. So that's another useful property of um, a constellation uh, constellation diagram because you can look at it and say ask yourself or perform a sanity check should all the powers should all the energies of all the signal constellation um, points the the waveforms that they represent should they all be equal in this case looking at the QPSK signal diagram that we just drew the answer is yes they should so they all should be equal to a squared t now if we take the average of the, uh, the, the energies, which is a no-brainer, they're all the same. So you take them, you add them together, it should, should, should be four times a squared t. And then divide by the number of signal constellation points, which is four, we get a squared t. So, so we're so far so good. Now, how do you get the average bit energy from the average symbol energy? And the answer is, what, what is the number of bits that take to represent each symbol? In this case, we do log base two of m, m being the number of signal constellation points, in this case, four. And so what happens is if we pr calculate that, it actually takes two bits to represent every signal constellation point. So we now take um, our average symbol energy and divide it by the number of bits per symbol 
and that yields the average bit energy. So plugging these two values into our power efficiency value, we get this remarkable outcome, which is four. Remember what I said before about how if we have a power efficiency of four, that's the best possible power efficiency that we can get when we use every single constellation point in the modulation scheme. So it turns out that BPSK and QPSK have the exact same power efficiency, but BPSK is better because it actually, you actually transmit twice the amount of information in a, uh, in a period T relative to BPSK. So this is a wonderful result. Let's now look at the first of several MRE uh, uh, modulation schemes. And what I mean by MRE is that we have M possible unique waveforms that are represented by um, M possible signal constellation points. And if we take log base 2 of M, that gives us the number of binary digits or bits that can represent each signal constellation point or unique waveform. So MRE is really a generic version of the PSK and PAM modulations that we've looked at before. So the first one we're going to look at is MRE phase shift scheme or MPSK. So remember what I said, all the unique information um, uh, 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 like that represents which binary pattern we're transmitting is in t for phase modulation is entirely represented by which phase we're choosing, not, not the amplitude and not the frequency. So as a result, because we have um, only the phase that's changing, um, as, as we'll see, um, the signal constellation diagram will actually look like a circle of signal constellation points because the amplitudes are the same and the frequencies are the same, but the phase values are different. So we basically have a circle of signal constellation points um, that um, surround the origin. Um, and, and so we have M of these points. And so mathematically, how do we represent MPSK? It's by equation five over here, which is SI of T is equal to A times cosine omega CT. So that's kept constant and T is the time index plus two pi I over M. So I is the signal constellation point index. And so what we're doing is we're equally spacing out the signal constellation points um, by two pi over m radians around the origin in the IQ plane. And so our signal constellation diagram should look like a ring of these m uh, signal constellation points. So uh, before we do the mathematical analysis of MPSK, uh, let's let's think. What are what are the pros and cons of this type of modulation scheme? Well, the prob the pr main problem of MPSK modulation schemes. We normally don't use very high order uh, PSK modulation schemes because the problem is you can imagine as we increase M, we're just compacting all those signal constellation points around that single un uh, single circle around the origin. So the space between the signal constellation points gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now the problem about having signal constellation points being too close together, as we'll see in the next segment of this course when we deal with error performance analysis, is that trying to decide which signal constellation point has been received when they're so close together becomes rather tricky. It actually makes it that the, the, the tolerance to noise and other sorts of errors actually becomes very low. And so we have to be very careful when transmitting using very high order um, uh, P, uh, PSK modulation schemes. On the other hand, if you have a channel that um, affects only the amplitude, like corrupts the amplitude of any transmission that you send over the air or on copper or in a fiber optic cable, then a phase modulation is, is, a, very, is, is a nice choice because there is no information in the amplitude, it's only in the phase. So it's a trade-off. Um, you lose robustness in terms of the tolerance to any sort of error because the points are too close together. But on the other hand, if you have only amplitude distortion, phase modulation probably is the way to go. So again, as before, we have our uh, multi-step process for computing the power efficiency of an MPSK. But this is going to be different than the other cases because in this case, 
we'll actually have to deal with um, um, creating generic expressions based on M. That's the, that's the hope. We hope to classify and be able to assess the uh, power efficiency of any MPSK modulation scheme for any M. Okay, so let's say that we define the first um, waveform uh, that represents the first signal constellation point of an MPSK modulation as uh, A cosine omega CT. And let's suppose the second one is equal to A cosine omega CT plus 2 pi over M. So they're only separated by 2 pi over M phase difference apart. So let's assume that is the closest two signal constellation points together in the signal constellation diagram. Okay, so what are what's their minimum Euclidean distance? And so, um, um, and 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 so that that in this case, it might actually be easier to use the alternative approach for calculating d min squared, which is the sum of the two symbol energies minus their correlation value. So we know that the energy again is related to how far um, each signal constellation point is from the origin. So. If we apply the definition for calculating the symbol energy, we get the, the expression in six, which is a squared t over two. So same energy should be for all uh, the, the, the signal constellation points. How about that correlation value, um, the uh, row one, two? Well, if we calculate that um, and use a little bit of trig, so we're gonna have a cosine a times cosine b scenario. So you have to pull out your trig identities in order to figure out what that's equal to. Um, uh, you ultimately should get an answer that's equal to a squared t over 2 times cosine the phase difference 2 pi over m. This is beautiful. So if we plug this in to our expression for d min squared we get an answer that's equal to a squared t 1 minus cosine 2 pi over m. So now that we have the symbol energies, and we know that the symbol energies are equal for all signal constellation points because this is a phase modulation scheme where the amplitude value is not changing, the average symbol energy should be equal to a squared t over uh, a, a squared times t. In order to get the average bit energy, we take log two, uh, log base two of m, and divide it uh, against um, uh, a squared t. And that should give us um, and uh, give, give us our um, uh, the, the answer where um, if uh, let's suppose that's equal to b. So we know what b is equal to. If we plug it into the equation for the power efficiency, we get a generic expression for MPSK that's equal to four b sine squared pi over two b, which is fantastic because now if 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 you tell me how many bits it takes to represent a signal constellation point or a waveform in an MPSK modulation scheme. I can tell you right away what its power efficiency is equal to. Okay, so that's MPSK. The next modulation scheme, a uh, generic modulation scheme that we'll be looking at in this lecture is MRE pulse amplitude modulation or MPAM. So MPAM is um, so, so is an extension of the binary PAM that we looked at in last lecture. Okay. So what MPAM is, is we saw the signal constellation diagram for binary PAM, which is essentially two points on the x-axis, and if, it's, if it has a positive amplitude, it's in uh, the, the positive domain of the x-axis, and if it's a negative amplitude, it's in the negative domain. So let's extend this to MRE values, so there are M signal constellation points. What we get essentially is, so all the information is not encoded in the phase, but rather all in the amplitude. So let's assume that we have a basic waveform, and we call it PT, this is our base waveform, and we describe the base waveform in this case, as we see here, is equal to uh, the, the two unit step functions subtracted from each other. One unit step function is delayed by a factor of t relative to the other. So it gives us this rectangular pulse. And all we're doing is we're manipulating only the amplitude value of this, uh, of this, uh, this pulse. And we choose our amplitude values to be um, spaced out uniformly. Um, uh, basically, 
uh, if we have an index uh, parameter i, uh, and, and we let's say i ranges from 1 all the way to m divided by 2, a i is equal to a, our base amplitude, times 2 i minus 1. So we space them out by, a, uh, by, a, by, a, uh, by, by 2. Uh, so every, um, every uh, signal constellation point has an amplitude value that differs by 2. So let's look at this graphically to get uh, a better understanding of how, of how this looks. So for an emery pam signal constellation diagram, what happens is we can, let's draw a very long line for the i and the q. It, it won't come in that much because what ends up happening is um, the, the i and q um, axes uh, of our emery pam modulation scheme is kind of interesting because all we really care about is, remember if we have our base pulse looks like some sort of square wave, right? Rectangular pulse from zero to t in a, a unit amplitude. And then if we modulate it by a, uh, two i minus one, right? What we get is essentially, if we choose um, i is equal to, um, and then that's plus or minus, i is equal to one, two, doo -doo 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 -doo, m over two, what we end up getting is, so that's zero. Our first signal constellation point will be at a, then at three a, then at 5a, all the way, okay, until what? Until, um, if you plug it in, uh, so what you get is um, um, m minus 1a. So m minus 1a. And then the exact opposite, we, we have minus a, minus 3a, minus m minus 1 a. So this is a beautiful modulation scheme because all it is is just regularly spaced out signal constellation points along the i axis. So now that we've seen what um, Emery or PAM uh, looks like, let's again, just as before, calculate its power efficiency. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the minimum including distance and from the signal diagram that we've just seen, um, that's rather straightforward. We look for two adjacent pairs of signal constellation points. So basically, let's look for two amplitude values that are next to each other. And we know that it's going to be spaced out by a value of 2a based on our equation from the f uh, first slide for this modulation scheme. So we know that there's sp the difference in the two waveforms will be 2a. So we, if we integrate, we use the equation for d min squared, the answer should be equal to 4a squared t. Now, um, the average symbol energy is a little different because the, uh, we notice, again, what, what the, the symbol energy is related to the distance that each signal constellation point is from the origin. Now, given that each signal constellation point um, that we have progressively gets farther and farther away from the origin, well, we're going to have like some sort of progression, if you will, of symbol energies are going to get larger and larger and larger because it takes a lot of energy to transmit that far away from the signal constellation point uh, from from the origin to the signal constellation point. So, um, so what we do is we came up with a generic expression for the average symbol energy, which is essentially we we have m values, and so we want to sum up uh, m values. But here's a trick: since the Emery Pam modulation scheme is symmetric about the origin. We only really need to calculate one half of these values because um, the, in the end, it, in the wash, it all comes out to about the same. So let's take the positive side of the axis only. So we go from zero and we go to infinity plus infinity on the x-axis or the i-axis, the in-phase axis. And what we do is we just take each symbol and we square it and we integrate from zero to t. And so what we, we get is this very interesting um, growing pattern. So remember that each signal constellation point has an amplitude of a times two i minus one, right? And so what happens if we integrate each one of that, we actually get a squared um, two i minus one squared times t because we're integrating over t. And so what we get is this very interesting um, summation here 
And it turns out that it, it actually has a closed form expression. We can actually represent this without a summation. And it turns out to be equal to a squared t m squared minus 1 over 3. And if we now divide it by two base, uh, log base 2 m, which gives us number of bits b, we get uh, the average bit energy um, equal to a squared t 2 to the 2b minus 1 divided by 3b. So if we plug this all back into our mpam power efficiency expression, we get 12b over 2 to the 2b minus 1. So that is a beautiful result because now for any MRE PAM modulation scheme, we know what its power efficiency is equal to. The last modulation scheme that we're going to be looking at is going to be our first foray into um, representing binary patterns in terms of both amplitudes and phase. So we use this modulation scheme called MRE Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, or MQAM. And MQAM is a beautiful modulation scheme. So whenever we deal with higher order modulation schemes in practice, we usually use MQAM because of the way the signal constellation points are uh, distributed across the IQ plane, but more importantly, because the receiver structure is actually relatively simple. In fact, what the receiver structure is, is suppose you have uh, data that's laid out in I and Q, all you're, all you're really doing is you're laying out your M qam modulation scheme as um, a two-dimensional uh, square, square root M PAM modulation in two dimensions. It's really neat. And let's, let's draw this now. So first of all, what does an MRE qam modulation scheme look like? So let's say we take 16 QAM. Okay, so basically M is equal to 16, which means that B is equal to 4, right? Because log 10 of M equals 4. So I and Q. And so we saw how, <coughs> excuse me, how SIJ of T is equal to ai cosine omega ct plus bj sine omega ct. So we're using cosine to modulate signal constellation points horizontally, and we're using sine to modulate signal constellation points vertically. So what happens is if we choose ai and bj to be evenly spaced out vertically and horizontally, what we can do is create an array of signal constellation points across the IQ plane that are evenly spaced and that are as best as possible. And each one of these guys, uh, 16 points, represents a combination of AI and BJ. So this is a beautiful, beautiful layout. This is a um, what we call a square QAM signal constellation diagram because essentially it's almost it's we, we've laid it out in terms of a, a, a grid pattern of signal constellation points which uh, it turns out uh, yield, it's, it's kind of interesting because it yields a very um, a very um, uh, helpful property when we try and design a receiver so what this has looked like to you it should look like to you essentially looking like we have PAM 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 PAM. We have some sort of PAM modulation happening in the I axis. And then we also have PAM, 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 PAM. We have a PAM modulation happening in the Q axis as well. So this is really powerful stuff because now what we've got is essentially, if you want to design a receiver, so suppose I receive SI J of T, what would I do? I would essentially, first of all, multiply that incoming waveform into two parallel streams by cosine omega ct, if I know at the receiver what frequency I'm dealing with, and sine omega ct. And then I low-pass filter. And, and OK, so you might say, OK, uh, prof, um, 
why are you low pass filtering? And the answer is, and this is really cool, so take this expression and multiply by a cosine. Take this expression and multiply by a sine. What do you get? It turns out that you're going to get a combination through trigonometric identities of DC terms, so terms that don't have any cosines or sines in them, and you're going to have cosines and sines with double frequency terms. And so a low pass filter, low pass filter here will filter out the double frequency terms because it's double the frequency of the original transmission. We only keep the DC term. That's really cool. So we only keep the A's and the B's, and that's where all the information is contained. So after we sample, sorry, after we sample each one of these guys with uh, every T seconds. We then use a PAM detector. We use the decoder for, in this case, square root of PAM. And that should give us AI and BJ. So that is a very powerful result. So for quadrature amplitude modulation, where we lay out the signal constellation points, in a rectangular or a square pattern, we can reduce it down to using just two very simple PAM demodulators after we do a little bit of math, uh, signal processing mathematics in order to get um, our um, respective amplitude values from which we can then do decoding into the binary pattern. So now that we've looked at how MQAMS looks like and, and um, or how to, how to generate it, um, so, and, and, we, and we saw how its signal constellation diagram looks like, which is phenomenal. Look at the beautiful symmetry that all those signal constellation points are positioned in the um, IQ plane. We now, um, now want to come up with, again, the power efficiency for an MQAM um, transmission. So first, um, let's look at uh, here at equation 9 how it looks like. And essentially, the elegance is represented in terms of how we lay out the signal constellation points using only cosine and sine functions. And so what's cool about cosines and sines is that they are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. They're orthogonal to each other. So we can transmit on one, and we can transmit on the other. And, and theoretically, the two will never interfere with each other because they're out of phase. Or they're, and, and, and because they're orthogonal, we can we can play in both dimensions, and so what happens is the cosine um, mo modulates our signal constellation point, or defines our waveforms across the x-axis, across the in-phase portion of the signal constellation diagram, whereas the sine value um, modulates our signal waveform, our signal constellation point, across the y-axis or the quadrature axis. So so it's great. So basically, depending on what our a i and b j are. This will define which signal constellation point uh, we're playing with in the IQ plane. So just as before, we want to calculate what the power efficiency is of uh, m -quam. So we calculate the d-min. And now here, the d-min is that we have an array of signal constellation points. But it turns out that the adjacent signal constellation points will yield the smallest Euclidean distance. And you can do that by inspection by looking at the signal constellation diagram yourself. So suppose we take S1 and S2 and apply the, the, the definition for d min squared. It turns out that the answer yields 2a squared t. And if now we compute the symbol energy, remember how it's related to the distances to the different signal constellation points in the signal constellation diagram. Again, remember, it's, it's the distance from the origin to each point. And because each quadrant now is symmetric with each other, we only actually really need to compute the signal constellation point for each quadrant, uh, for just one quadrant, and, and in order to find the average symbol energy, because uh, otherwise it's just wasted effort if you want to do it for all four. And this is actually very helpful, because what ends up happening is imagine you have a very large signal constellation representation, like uh, 64 qualm or 256 qualm. That's a lot of symbol energies that you've got to compute. On the other hand, if you just have to worry about one sector, this is a lot easier to work with. And what it turns out is that if we solve for the average symbol energy, we get 
a squared t m minus 1 divided by 3 and then divided by the number of bits b to give us the average bit energy gives us a squared t 2 to the b minus 1 divided by 3b. Plugging it into the, uh, the power efficiency equation, d min squared divided by uh, 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 eb bar, we get the power efficiency for mqam equal to 3 factorial b divided by 2b minus 1. And so this is, again, another beautiful result. So in this lecture, we've covered three sort of generic, very commonly used uh, 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 modulation schemes and derive their um, power efficiency based only solely on the number of bits that need to be represented for each um, uh, signal modulation scheme. And so now, it, this is what all engineers do, given that we have all these modulation schemes, what's, what, what is the performance, what's the trade-offs between each one of these signal modulation schemes? So what, what, the, what, what I've done is laid out here in a table um, for different M values, so basically a different number of signal constellation points, <clears throat> what are the power efficiency values? Um, or in this case, um, uh, instead of power efficiency, um, what, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I actually defined something called uh, delta SNR, or the, the SNR loss, if you will, uh, for each one of the modulation schemes. What this means is uh, how much are we off by from the optimal, the best possible one, which is 4. So what I do is I, uh, delta SNR is equal to 10 log 10. Okay, so this is already in dB. Um, uh, the, the power efficiency of QPSK, which is 4, divided by the power efficiency of the other modulation scheme. So we want to see how far off we are from the optimal power efficiency for MASK. So that's uh, uh, amplitude, uh, uh, sorry, that's a MRA amplitude shift scheme. That's equal to MPAM, um, MPSK, and MQAM. And so for different values of m, which is represented by a different number of bits, we have this arrangement. And what we see is there are several very important things to note. So first of all, the, the one-dimensional modulation scheme, in this case the MS, MASK or MPAM, always possesses a far worse power efficiency for higher order representations relative to MPSK or MQAM which are both two-dimensional modulation schemes. As you can see from the values here, it has the largest numbers, the largest delta SNR values. The other thing to note is MQAM possesses the best power efficiency, but you notice that for cases of um, M equals 8 and M equals 32, we really don't know what the values are, and that's because uh, for 8 and 32, we don't have a fixed arrangement. How do you lay out these signal constellation points? So that, that's a little bit ambiguous, and so we don't know what those values are, but there are some modulation schemes that implement MQAM using those number of signal constellation points, but we, we cannot make any sort of generalized claim here. Okay. So, so the punchline for the power efficiency in the table we just saw is that two-dimensional modulation is better than one-dimensional modulation in terms of power efficiency. And that all modulation schemes studied here are linear modulation schemes, which is great because, as you saw, receiver complexity is rather straightforward.